very military style that uh, we might be able to get out a couple minutes early then. I was all right. expecting a little bit longer break. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so how are we paying for this? Write a check. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be part of your family. <laughs> What's that? No, Frequent flyer miles. Frequent flyer miles. Great. You know, Delta's making it a little harder now, you know, I've heard. So. Yeah, use your, use your points off your Chase credit card. I'm not sure about that. Well, actually, the number one payer for long-term care in Minnesota is a program called Medical Assistance. Federally, it's known as Medicaid. You may have heard of that program. Medicaid is different from Medicare. Medicaid is a program for people who are severely low income or severely low resourced. Um, in Minnesota, we call resource assets. So an individual to qualify for medical assistance, or MA, you may have heard it referred to as MA, you have to have very, very low income and assets of under $4,000 for an individual. If you have more income, you can still qualify for MA, medical assistance, through what's known as a spend down. You spend down your income and your assets to qualify for MA. And once you qualify, MA kicks in and will start paying. So that's often what people in nursing homes do, is you can generally pay for a little while in a nursing home. You spend down what's in your savings, your checking account, maybe your retirement, your pension, and you can pay for a little bit of it with your social security or if you have a, a private retiree pension. But eventually you're gonna to have to spend down and once you spend down, then, then MA kicks in. And medical assistance is funded through, through two different um, payers, the state and the federal government. It's a match program. So the federal government gives us some money and the state pays for some. And it's not like Medicare, and I'll talk about Medicare in a second, that has its own revenue stream, where Medicare is taken out of all of our checks, those of us who work, and it pays for Medicare Part A. MA, or medical assistance, comes out of the general fund. So when they're coming up with that budget, those taxes that come in through sales tax or income tax, that's the money that goes to pay for medical assistance. That's the same money that goes to pay for the Department of Transportation the Environmental uh, Control Agency, um, it pays for all of those services. So it's part of the general fund, okay? So, so generally nursing homes pay private until you no longer have the income or the resources or the assets, and then medical assistance kicks in. Minnesota, um, just sort of another little tangent about um, nursing home, is in a, um, one of two states in the U.S. that has something known as rate equalization. Rate equalization means that if you're private paying for a nursing home, you pay the same amount someone on medical assistance pays. They can't charge you more. And the main reason for that is the state government does not want you to spend down your income and assets faster to qualify for MA. That is also why you see many nursing homes may not have such a absolute beautiful atrium or building because on the other side, again, being a, uh, having my nursing home administrator's license and having to work in a nursing home to get that, you have to balance a budget. And when you're getting medical assistance is one of the lowest reimbursers for service. You want Medicare because it reimburses at a higher amount. MA reimburses so low. So if you, can, if you can't subsidize your care by charging people who pay privately a little bit more, you have less money coming in to be able to do repairs to your facility and those kinds of things. So it's sort of this paradox of long-term care that we don't want people to spend down to qualify for private pay, but if we don't allow nursing homes to increase their revenue, they'll never be able to modernize or be, most of the time, the best way to modernize a nursing home close the one you're in and rebuild one next door. Because um, if you even wanted to take down a wall, the number of codes you have to <laughs> follow when you take down the wall, so it's, it's a little tough. So this is where I talk a little bit about how we pay for aging services from an individual perspective. And many of you may have heard these terms before. Um, the first one is um, Medicare. 
And I have two special little um, demographic reports. There are five. What a prize, huh? Um, for the person who can guess correctly the year Medicare passed. Who said that? 1965? You won it. Here's some late night reading for you. Yay. Yay. So, <laughs> Medicare passed in 1965. Medicare pays for health services. I'm not going to go into a Medicare 101, that's a different type of lecture, but basically there are four types to Medicare, right? Four parts, A, B, C, and D. Medicare Part A is the only one that's paid for with that tax that comes out of your check. Medicare's Part B, C, and D are not paid for and are paid for out of the general fund. So the same money that goes into paying for things like our streets and our national parks. And Medicare is a completely federal program. It does not pay for long-term care. So it does not pay for stays in the nursing home except for rehab. Um, and that's sort of what nursing homes are looking for is that Medicare, because Medicare reimburses at a higher rate than medical assistance. But in order for Medicare to pay for your nursing home stay, anyone know the magical criteria? Read <laughs> that hospital stay. You must be admitted to a hospital. Um, otherwise, um, Medicare will not pay for rehab. Um, so, uh, let's see anything else I wanted to. Oh, Medicare in general pays about 80% um, of your cost for services. You have to pay the other 20% out of pocket. And, Often, you may have what's known as a Medicare Supplemental Insurance Policy. That's what it's called in Minnesota. It's also known as a Medigap Policy. It pays for the gaps that Medicare doesn't pay. Um, Medicare doesn't pay for three things that everyone in this room at some point um, is going to need. Glasses, dentures, and hearing aids. It doesn't pay for any of those things. Um, and that's what you would get the Medigap and the Medicare Supplemental Insurance Policy for to help with some of those costs. Okay. The next one is Social Security. So this is for the second illustrious demographic report that I commissioned. Um, so it's, I'll even sign it for you if you want later. Um, <laughs> what year was Social Security enacted? Yes! It was enacted to help stave off some of the results of the Great Depression. Yeah. Um, remember, stock market crash, 1929, Great Depression in the 30s. Um, Social Security was part of FDR's reform to, um, you know, get the economy um, back going to, to help individuals. So Social Security is actually like Medicare. When we say Medicare, people think it's one thing. Social Security also is many things. When we talk about Social Security for older adults, most often we're talking about retirement um, income. So um, the, the retirement, um, uh, what's also known as Title II of the Social Security Act. But there's another part of Social Security that individuals may have. If maybe they didn't qualify for retirement income, so they, they didn't work enough what's known as credits in order to qualify for Social Security, so to get Social Security, it's an insurance model, just like Medicare, you pay into it, then you will get it. Some people maybe didn't pay into it, um, but they have no income. Uh, the government determined that individuals, in order to survive, need at least $721 a month um, to, to sort of live. That's the basic amount of money that you need every month to to live in, in the, the actual 48 states, Alaska and Hawaii, something different. Um, that program is called Supplemental Security Income, SSI, and it's Title 16 of the Social Security Act. So when you're working with people, they may say, you know, I've got Social Security, there's all kinds of Social Security programs, disability, widower's um, benefits, survivor benefits. Um, but, but the Social Security Retirement Program is, again, an insurance model where you have had money taken out of your paycheck so that in the future, uh, you can have a, a Social Security check. Um, when I give sort of my little talk about Medicare and Social Security, it's a different one that I give, um, I have a funny little comic that I show people, because 
A few years ago, um, in the previous administration, there was a lot of talk about Social Security and, you know, we need to make changes to Social Security because it's not solvent, you know, whatever. We need to privatize it or we need to do block grants or we need to do something differently. And a comment came out uh, uh, about it. There were two sort of um, people from Congress, you know, talking and they were holding this little ball. And if you looked at the ball, it was a bomb and on the bomb it said Social Security. And as you sort of panned back, they were standing on a globe, but it actually wasn't a globe. It was a bigger bomb, and it was Medicaid. And so the issue is, <laughs> Social Security is fairly solvent. Um, maybe a few changes need to be made, and they're already making some changes. I won't be able to collect Social Security until at the earliest 70. Um, you know, today's baby boomers can collect it at 62. There's, um, you know, different age requirements. It's, it's really Medicaid and Medicare that are, are um, causing issues because we just have such an explosion of health care. Um, and we briefly talked at break about um, a lot of the costs related to health care actually come in, in uh, a little under than the last two years of our life. There's a lot of expenses during that time period. And um, it's very political. There's good policy and then there's politics. And, when you start talking about services at the end of life, you start hearing words like rationing of health care or the dreaded death panels. We do not talk about um, sort of planning for you know, the end of our life. Um, so it gets enamored in politics, unfortunately, um, and, and the media just sort of flames those fires. So the next funding, so, so Social Security helps a person so they can pay for it themselves. They could write a check sort of using their Social Security dollars. The next way would be waivers and subsidies. So waivers and subsidies are available for people who have very, very, very low incomes. They qualify for programs that you may have heard of called elderly waiver or alternative care or CADI, community alternatives for disabled individuals. What we do in Minnesota, we um, tend to be very service rich and our medical assistance program pays for a lot of things. Um, the federal government requires us to cover certain things, and one of them is nursing home care. Um, medical assistance or Medicaid is not mandatory. States choose if they want to be in the Medicaid program. In fact, Medicaid was enacted in 1965, and the last state to participate was Arizona. They didn't participate until 1980, so there was no health care coverage for, for people who were severely low income um, for quite a few years. So what we do in Minnesota is we say, you know what, federal government, nursing homes cost a lot of money, you know, $73,000. And really, people don't want to live there. People aren't knocking on the nursing home door. Okay, I'm 65, where's my bed? I mean, that's just not how it works. Like, that's like the pay, you know, the last place you want to go. And God bless nursing homes for all the work they do and the care that's provided in them and how important they are to the lives of individuals that live in them. There was my disclaimer. Um, with that being said, people don't want to be in one. It's sort of a last resort. People who have memory problems or who have um, very severe physical limitations that require that 24-hour nursing. What the state said was, you know, if we want to take some of that money that you tell us we have to pay for nursing homes, and we want to pay for services out in the community like non-medical companion services. We are requesting a waiver from our Medicaid obligation. So my goodness, they're requesting a waiver. They actually called it a waiver. It's one of the times the government actually named something that makes sense. Um, so the elderly waiver program is exactly that. They are, they are requesting a waiver from our obligations that the federal government says we must to say, you know what, instead of paying for this, we see this as really important for the citizens of the great state of Minnesota. Will you allow us to do that? And they do. So we have the elderly waiver program. So in Minnesota, um, our legislature, every once in a while, they have a good idea. I'll give them a little credit sometimes. They said that is for people who are so severely low income. They have to qualify for MA. It's very, very low income. We want to help people who maybe are, are a little bit higher than that income, who still aren't able to private pay. They just don't have the income and resources. So we want to have a very, very similar program to elderly waiver. Um, for a little higher income, we're going to call it alternative care. So the alternative care grant is very similar. They pay for the, um, pretty much the same thing. Right now, the state is going through a 
realignment so that no matter what waiver you're on, all the services are available or the reimbursements are the same. The last one I mentioned was CADI. So eligible waiver and alternative care are only for people 65 and older. There are all kinds of waiver programs for people under the age of 65. Once you turn 65, you're bumped off those waiver programs. So if you're on a waiver call, for example, the BI, the brain injury waiver, when you turn 65, you're kicked off that waiver. The only exception is the CADI waiver. If you're on CADI as a younger person, you can keep CADI when you turn 65 and you won't be forced on elderly waiver. So it's, it's the Community Alternatives for Disabled Individuals. It's an MA waiver, low income, low assets. It's the same, it's pretty much the same thing as elderly waiver for people under 65. If you have a disability, um, that, that qualifies you under 65 for CADI. But they're allowed to stay on a disabled under before they turn 65. Yes. Yeah. And at one time, there was a big reason why people would do that. It's because every waiver had a different service menu and a different reimbursement rate. So if you were on CADI, you could get some things. You could pay for certain things you couldn't pay for on elderly waiver. That's changing. It's a very difficult conversation that's being had because some people are going to lose, some people are going to win. Everything's going to, you know, I think everyone's going to win a little and lose a little, but getting through that. So all of the waivers. So the waivers include, you know, I said elderly waiver, alternative care, CADI, there's a brain injury waiver, a DD waiver, developmental disability waiver. There's a waiver for children called CAC. Um, there is a waiver, did I hit all of them? I think maybe I hit all of them. That's all. So, so there are lots of different waiver programs. They all pretty much do a similar thing, but they did it differently before. That's changing rapidly. All right, next. Private philanthropy. So, um, as part of my job, I do have a consulting business and um, have worked in, in the field of aging and that. I also work for Greater Twin Cities United Way where I manage the aging and disability projects there. And every year, United Way invests about $5 million in the nine counties surrounding Minneapolis and St. Paul to pay for services for older adults and people with disabilities. So we pay for services like transportation, meals, medication, health, some, some home health care help for sp uh, specific populations, some adult day for specific populations. That's an example of private philanthropy. There is a govern government equivalent to that, and it's called the Older Americans Act. Has anyone heard of the Older Americans Act? So it's, it's a great program. Um, actually, I did my, um, my PhD dissertation on the Older Americans Act. It also passed in 1965. It, um, is a program that provides grants to states and, and area agencies on aging to fund the kind of the same services, so transportation, they fund some legal support. The Older Americans Act is the number one funder for home delivered meals. People often refer to it as Meals on Wheels. Um, so it's the, the number one funder of that across the US. So I kind of lock that in with private philanthropy as well. Um, and then lastly, which actually is firstly, we're going to use it. Firstly, private pay and sliding fee. The actual number one payer of services is private pay. People just write a check, whether it's them or their um, spouse or um, partner or their kids or whomever just pays um, for, for services. The sliding fee scale, I'm sure many of you probably um, understand that concept, but some providers will um, sort of give discounts to people based on their income. So they'll sort of look at your, you'll report income and say, you know, I make $25,000 a year. Um, well, your income, it looks like, you know, you could afford $75 rather than our $85 fee. So they kind of work with the person and often the money is then subsidized through private philanthropy or by charging private pay people a little bit more. So I talked very briefly about rate equalization. Remember in, in Minnesota, if a person in a nursing home is on medical assistance or private pay, they have to pay the same thing. We also have something in Minnesota called assignment, and that falls into the Medicare program. Some states, like the one, is it that way? No, 
store shall remain nameless, cheese notes. They do not have assignment. Basically what happens is, we'll go, let's use some numbers, I'll throw a couple numbers out. So you go in and you have a service that costs $100 and you're on Medicare. Um, Medicare has determined that that costs $100. We will pay $100. According to Medicare law, that provider can actually upcharge. They can upcharge up to 20% so that, that, that you may get charged $120 for that service, right? In Minnesota, you can't do that. If you accept Medicare, you must accept assignment. So if Medicare says that that service costs $100, you can only charge $100. Because remember, Medicare only pays about 80%, so you're already paying $20 out of pocket, right? In Wisconsin, you'd be paying that $20 out of pocket plus the $20 upcharge. So you're paying $40 out of pocket. So a little um, sort of payment for Medicare makes it a little bit um, difficult in, in Minnesota as well. Not for the consumer, but for the provider. Right? Any questions about funding or it's just like a little tiptoe into the funding. <laughs> Each one of these is, I teach right now, I'm teaching on Thursday nights aging and disability policy. Literally, we spend a week on each one of these bullets up there. Yes? You know, I'm not quite sure I understand Social Security fully for the longest time. I thought it was the fallback for people who didn't earn enough and that, but now I is that you pay based on your income. So the higher your income, the more you pay. Now, the more you're going to get as well. The other thing with Social Security is actually it caps the tax. So people are only taxed on Social Security earnings at the about $100,000 level. You don't pay Social Security tax beyond that. The argument for not, for, for maintaining Social Security, regardless of income, is it's known as what's it, it, it's known as an entitlement, and when you take away the universal principle of social security, you start having some people not receiving it, and then it starts to become stigmatized. That social security becomes the program only for poor people, and let's just keep cutting it because that's what we do to programs for poor people. So the argument, and I I hear you one hundred percent that well. The, Warren Buffett doesn't need Social Security. What the heck? Why are we giving it to him? Um, it, but it, it sort of erodes at the principle of an entitlement, a right. Social Security is a right. And people on Social Security aren't stigmatized. People say they're on Social Security. It's not bad. But people won't tell you that they're on food stamps. Or they won't tell you that they're on TANF, which is our wealth program, and or they won't tell you that they're on medical assistance because those programs are so heavily stigmatized because they're for poor people who couldn't make enough money. They couldn't make it work. So that's kind of the argument. It's a philosophical debate. Um, but, so thank you for the question. All right. Anything else on funding before we move on? All right. So we have, um, we talked about sort of significant disparities in healthcare, right? We've got some, some issues and other factors, but by and large, older adults in Minnesota are a healthy group. It's really, it's a good thing, you know, as Martha Stewart would say. 
Um, but when we do look at some interesting statistics on the rates of health, there are kind of some things that make us wonder a little bit. The first one is disability. This comes from the American Community Survey, which is part of the, the long form of the census. Does anyone have the pleasure of filling out the long form of the census? It's a pretty amazing questionnaire. That found that 31% of people 65 and plus reported that they had a disability. About one third. Not overly bad, but when you start looking at comparison to other age groups, so I have those numbers. So people under the age of five, their rate is 1.7% have a disability. That probably makes sense, little newborns. Five to seven, six percent. Five, sorry, five to 17, six percent have a disability. And 18 to 64, seven percent have a disability. And the two winners of the book, after they read it tonight, will be able to answer all your questions. Because <laughs> these are all in there. So. We look also at um, Alzheimer's disease and uh, related dementias. 65 plus is 13%. When policymakers look at ages, they sort of look at 65%, they can qualify for federal programs. In the state, hurrah, you can get Medicare. No problem. We don't pay a penny of Medicare in the state. It's a federal program. But they also look at 85 plus. 85 seems to be sort of a number when individuals start needing a bit more services um, in order to stay independent. So that's really the number that people look at. Look at the shift in Alzheimer's disease, 85 plus, 42%, almost half, half of people over age 85 have, have dementia or some form of Alzheimer's disease. And yes? Do they, I, this is so interesting, this, uh, that, that movement from Yeah, so it is difficult to, Alzheimer's disease is, is difficult to measure, number one, because it's not diagnosed very often. It's, it's often, sort of, there is huge stigma in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So often people push diagnosis until it really starts affecting them. So there may be some sort of that we're not catching in the 65 plus, but I'm pretty confident the 85 plus number is the other thing with it, with, with that we have to remember about Alzheimer's and dementia is that it is a degenerative progressive disorder, and someone doesn't just wake up with Alzheimer's disease, right, and forget everything and need total supports. There's lots of coping mechanisms. A person can be very vital. I went to a meeting last Monday, and a gentleman, it was a meeting for ACT on Alzheimer's, and a gentleman stood up and he started telling his story, and he said, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease four years ago. And it's sort of like, you know, that, that isn't what people have a picture of Alzheimer's. The picture of Alzheimer's is the elderly person, you know, who, who, who is no longer able to cope. Um, the, the state of Minnesota has really heightened Alzheimer's disease and dementia extensively. And they did that a couple years ago through um, a, a legislative commission called the Alzheimer's Disease Working Group. Just a simple little working group that they said the Board on Aging needs to pull together that group has morphed over the last two years now to include over 80 organizations, and it's called Act on Alzheimer's. And Act on Alzheimer's is not funded by the federal, uh, by the federal or state government. It's funded through private philanthropy and donations. And they're looking really at four major categories. One is early diagnosis, because early diagnosis is so critical in the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. You can catch Alzheimer's disease early on. You can slow the progression phenomenally. Alzheimer's disease at this point cannot be stopped or reversed, but it can be slowed. And, and so early diet, the earlier you catch it, the, the better chance you have. Mm -hmm. well, I've been hearing reports that people younger than 60 are getting Alzheimer's now. Is that true or is that um, yeah. like in their 40s, even some 20 years? Yeah, so you can get um, Alzheimer's disease at any age in your life. It is rarer um, prior to age 65. It's considered early onset Alzheimer's disease, but it is very much um, possible. I think, sounds like a great topic, you could put on your evaluation sheets would be sort of an overview of dementia because Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia. And some people 
are put into the Alzheimer's disease category when they don't have Alzheimer's disease. They could have something completely different. They could have Lewy body or Creutzfeldt Jakob syndrome or Korsakoff psychosis or um, multi infarct or Parkinson's related or AIDS related or there are so many types of dementia under that umbrella. Alzheimer's is the number one right now. It's the, the, the largest proportion, but people may have a, a, another form of dementia under, under 65. The other thing ACT on Alzheimer's is looking at doing is building community awareness. So there's actually a community toolkit to create a dementia-friendly community. You can download it and use it, and there are cities, Forest Lake, Richfield, um, the city of St. Paul, Minneapolis, have used this toolkit to sort of start their discussions to, to create a dementia-friendly community. They also are attempting to decrease the stigmatization. So often people don't want to be diagnosed early because there's such a horrible stigma. It's, it's, it's a, a disease that carries a great burden. Um, and so they're trying to um, really bring Alzheimer's disease out of, the, out of, out of hiding and, and let people know that there are people in every community that have Alzheimer's disease. They are vibrant members and, um, and to support them. Um, and then treatment. They're trying to help with treatment options for Alzheimer's because at this point it's a progressive degenerative disease. There's, there's no um, cure. The, um, I, I haven't heard about Alzheimer's. Years ago was the first time it started coming up to me. Is that when they started making it, naming it, or was it always been there but they just never talked about it? Yeah, so it's been been around for about 100 years, but the the um, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease increases as we age. And think about um, at the beginning of my little talk today, we talked about the life expectancy. People didn't live long enough to really get Alzheimer's disease as much as they do today. So that was, what a great tie. You're like a plant to have a tie. <laughs> and then when we look at mental illness, about 11% of 65 plus um, have um, considered themselves having a mental illness. However, when looking at that, you think, well, those are pretty kind of gloomy numbers. But when you ask people about their health, um, what do you consider your health status to be? To be the vast majority rate it as excellent, very good, or good. And that's even more important than your actual diagnosis, because this is how you view your health. It doesn't matter what diseases you have diagnosed or, or how your body feels. This is how you actually feel your health status. So that's really good that people in general over the age of 65 report that they, they, have, they feel Mind over matter. So we're heading into the home stretch here a little bit. This is good. No one has um, like completely hit the table. That is great. <laughs> I'm about ready to. But um, so so are we ready? Well, we know that about one quarter of baby boomers, and this is specific to Minnesota, will not have adequate retirement income to support their health care. Um, that's a study that was done by the University of Minnesota and the Department of Human Services. There was a national study that found that only 46% of U.S. communities have begun planning to address the aging of the baby boom generation. So these would be cities and towns. They're just sort of, it's not on their radar. That has changed quite a bit over the last five years. There's a lot more. Um, the quarter baby boomers is about, uh, is over half a million people in Minnesota will not have um, adequate so we've talked about the demographic impacts, then the economic impacts. So what does that mean for Minnesota? Well, we have lots of societal implications that are happening. The first is going to be a tough one to wrap your head around when you hear the news media and what's happening in society. Surprise, we have a labor shortage. <laughs> what we hear is all kinds of unemployment. We hear every day, what's the unemployment? What, were the, what jobs were released? You know, the Department of Labor releases their jobs report. What was released? Well, we actually are moving into the next couple decades of significant labor shortage. And there's a number of reasons for that. Number one is the replacement. We were talking about that flip kind of in the dependency ratio and not having as many children. As people retire, we don't have enough people to take their positions. We don't have enough people in high-skilled positions to take their positions. High-skilled 
areas to take their positions. And to give you an example, we currently have a labor force shortage in nursing and attorneys. People often don't care about the attorneys. We could do with the shortage, but the problem is we don't have people that have gone through enough education to replace the needs in those areas. It's particularly high-skilled areas we're facing a labor force shortage. And this statistic came last year in May. I participated in a, a community gathering that the Lieutenant Governor had on an aging workforce. And someone from the Department of Employment and Economic Development talked, and he said, you wouldn't think that we have a labor for, force shortage because all you hear about are, is unemployment and people needing jobs. But when you start looking really carefully, really think about, especially in the area you're in, how many times have you heard that there just aren't enough nurses staffing a nursing home? or a hospital. So we have a significant labor force shortage currently. Um, also, we know that more people are going to be receiving entitlements than paying into them. We talked about that when we had that economic discussion earlier, right? We're gonna have to have tough conversations. And people um, often use the term, um, the social contract. We have to have a conversation about that social contract, what we promised people, and what we want to pay for. My argument is that there's enough money, we're just paying for things that maybe we don't have to pay for. Um, but that's a political response, not a policy response. Um, so we have to talk about where are our priorities. Are we going to pay for A or are we going to pay for B? Especially when more people are going to be taking money for A. So something we have to talk about. We also have an increasing cultural divide between the young and old. When we're looking at the demographics of children, they don't look like the children of 10, 15 years ago. Um, they are a more diverse group than ever before. So we're going to have a significant white older population with a significant community of color younger population. And people think, well, that happens in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And last week we had a speaker from um, Burnsville well, we could say Burnsville, that's pretty southern natural, right? Um, Burnsville, um, in the Burnsville School District, they speak 83 languages. And so we're talking about <coughs> all over the state of Minnesota, this is happening, this change. And so this increasing cultural divide um, between youth and older adults is going to be pretty interesting to see. And how do we make those connections across generations? Because we have to, we can't have two separate populations living together and never do the two meet um, because that's not how our society is built. Younger generations have always provided services in some way for older generations and so we have to think about that. And this just gives you an idea, you know, the um, average life expectancy for whites, 83, for American Indians, 61.5. It shows you sort of the age um, uh, of what is an older adult in these communities. The other thing that came out interestingly from, um, and, and this actually was just echoed, I was listening to NPR um, two weeks ago, and they were talking about sort of the life expectancy along I-94. And you can go within a 10 miles of I-94 and experience a 15 year life expectancy difference, which is pretty significant. To the point that they said, and this I nearly ran off the road, I shouldn't listen to NPR while I'm driving, I guess. <laughs> they said that health plans, it is cheaper for health plans to move people out of neighborhoods into other neighborhoods. It impacts their life expectancy more than bringing services to them. Like this radical proposal. And so all of these interesting conversations, so um, the numbers that you have here are just some that I took. For example, a community with a high income has a life expectancy of 84 versus low of 76. This is in um, one county. The lowest um, poverty rate is 83 versus poverty level um, would be 77. So you can see that something's happening where you live um, and, and affecting your life expectancy. So on to the final wrap up. Good on time. The new normal, not the TV show, Minnesota, what's really going to be happening. Um, and, and this is a term that demographers have been using for a long time. We're, we're not going to change going into the future. So first, the budget. If you haven't heard, we have federal budget problems. We always have them. 
in 2010, Congress, in their infinite wisdom, attempted to um, come to a grand budget agreement. Do you remember hearing this, that they sort of picked some senators from both parties and some House members from both parties. They were supposed to go into a room, close the door, they come out with a budget, and the Senate and the House would approve it, no questions asked. That lasted about an hour. The senators <laughs> walked out. The result was something known as sequestration. Anyone heard that term before? I'm sure it's been in the news, sequester, sequestration. Sequestration is what Speaker um, Boehner said is that it is like taking a hatchet to, um, to butchering, to, to, what do you call it, butchery? Butchery, like a butcher shop? Yeah, using a hatchet to, to butcher. Um, they don't get to pick. The cuts were just made across the board. Everyone got cut. It didn't matter. There was no <coughs> logic. Just everyone got cut. Um, that happened. Sequestration happened, and programs were cut in, in 2013. Senator Murray and Representative Ryan, a Democrat from Washington and a Republican from Wisconsin, came together and did pass a budget bill, finally, um, this past year. But not in time for some sequestration cuts to hit. They did put the money back in to some of those cuts, but the budget significantly cut services. Um, so even with sequestration gone, we have a budget that's less, that's less money. Things are continuing to be cut. And that's gonna be the future going forward. So programs will continue. Uh, we have to figure out how to, to, to just change. We can't live the same way we were. We don't have the same amount of money going in to pay for things. Healthcare reform. Now, this is a huge um, topic that could be also its own time. What I want to talk about is not the insurance, not Minsure or the, the insurance exchange. I am a proud user of Minsure. I will tell you, I did go through Minsure and I saved $300 a month on my health insurance thanks to using Minsure because I have my own private company. So I went through it, and um, my age and um, geography got me at that $160 a month is what I pay for health insurance now, which is pretty phenomenal. But I'm not going to talk about the health insurance, even though I just did. What I want to talk about is the other stuff that health care reform brought along, and it brought along something called the triple aim. Has anyone heard of the triple aim? Yeah, no, it's not something that's making the front pages. The fact that the Minsure director went to vacation to Costa Rica a week before Minsure went live made the paper. Rightfully so, probably. But reform is helping us cap health care costs. We have this huge curve of health care costs. They just continue to go up, 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 up. The triple aim is helping transform our systems to stop that spending. The analogy that's used is we're paying for a Cadillac but we're getting a jalopy. Could we at least get, I don't know, a Kia? Something that, <laughs> something between them, you know? And so that's what, it, that's what healthcare reform is really about attempting to do. It's to change our healthcare for the better. And the triple aim is attempting to look at three things. The first is better health for the population. Population statistics. How can we do better as a society? That's the first part of the triple aim. The second part is better care for individuals. So each one of us in the room, individually, we have access to a primary care physician. We have good preventive medicine. We have access to health care. That's better health for individuals. And then the last one is lower cost through improvements. So lower cost throughout um, by improving the system. Looking at the waste or the abuse or the fraud, trying to really bring that together. That's what the triple A is about. That's what health care reform is about. Not about you know who who can you know the insurance marketplace and how the websites aren't working and it's a pain in the butt and how political it is. It's it's really about um, really transforming our healthcare system for the better. And that's not going to go away. They've tried to repeal it 50 times in the House. It's not going to go away. So um, and they'll keep continuing to repeal it. Um, decline in institutional care. So um, Minnesota used to be what's known as overbedded. We had too many nursing home beds for the amount of people that needed them. And people who were able to live in the community, their only option was a nursing home. 
So I teach in the nursing home administrators program, and the analogy that I use is gone are the days when Aunt Millie, who can still knit a pair of mittens in a week in your nursing home, that's gone. Aunt Millie is in the community, and she has non-medical companion providers. She has home health care. She needs it, meals on wheels. So we have this decline in the use of institutional care and this increase in home and community-based services. Um, and Minnesota was overbedded. We're at about average now. Um, so we've actually taken down thousands of nursing home beds over the last 10 years, um, and we still have a few more to go. Caregiver support. Now, I have to be careful using this word. Um, when I refer to caregiver here, I mean, to the, I mean the unpaid informal caregivers, so friends and family members. In Minnesota, friends and family members provide 91% of care to older adults living in the community. 91% of care is provided by unpaid people. For every 1% drop in care, if we go from 91 to 90%, the state has to kick in $30 million to cover those services, to shovel driveways, to provide meals, to take people grocery shopping um, through those programs. So caregiver support is a huge program, and you're actually providing a form of caregiver support. And I'm not sure if you, if you sort of describe it as this, but it's respite care. Respite care is a significant part of caregiver support. It helps decrease burden and depression and increase caregiver satisfaction. So that a caregiver who may be in an intense caregiver relationship has an opportunity to leave, and they don't have to worry because you're there. You're there to worry for them, <laughs> to provide that support, that companionship services. So it's just one form of caregiver support that the state is investing. And lastly, aging and disability integration. We have limited dollars to serve individuals, and up until now we've been serving people with disabilities and older adults on parallel tracks, investing in things sometimes differently, sometimes the same. But when you look at the federal and state government, you can see those tracks coming together. Already we see that the waiver programs are all realigning. So they're gonna be paying for similar services or similar reimbursement. At the federal level, what used to be known as the Administration on Aging, it's still there, but it has combined with other administrations, the Administration for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, the Administration for Disabilities to become the Administration for Community Living. So the idea is what can we learn from one another, from the disability community and the aging community, to really use our resources wisely, to be person-centered to individuals who need services, and to maximize those dollars. We don't have a lot to go around. That is all I had to say. <laughs> You know, my sincere thanks to all of you. My parents have both fallen over the last year, and right at home is my next step. I, my first step was to lock their door and never let them leave. That does not <laughs> seem to be realistic. They want to leave. Um, uh, so the work that you do is so important to the lives of, of Minnesotans and, um, and to older adults and caregivers. The other thing I want to say is you have an evaluation you have to complete. <laughs> so please do so, and I appreciate um, having the opportunity to speak to all of you. So thank you to Paul and Bob for inviting me and having this meeting.